What does this surveillance aircraft, this cargo aircraft, and this stealth bomber all have in common? We're going to tell you in a special episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Mashat. By request, my special thanks to my dear friend Craig Caston for the idea for this episode. And you're going to see many of Craig's images uh, a little later in the program. Well, what these three diverse aircraft have in common, and I'll throw in one more for good measure, is that they are Douglas Concepts, which at one time were Douglas Secret Projects. Full disclosure, if you're new to the channel, I'll mention that I worked for the Douglas Division of the McDonnell Douglas Corporation from 1977 to 1987, and was very privileged to be a staff illustrator in the presentations department and I'll be showing you some of my images as well later in the program. So let's talk about secret projects and what we actually called them in-house was advanced design. Let's start with this one. This is the span loader, which is a cargo airplane that carries its payload in the wings and the fuel is in the fuselage. Uh, there are other blended wing designs flying uh, today uh, in uh, mock-up form or model form. And uh, this was the beginning. This was uh, 1978. You notice the traditional uh, conventional configuration cargo airplane in the background showing the, the comparison for loading and unloading. But the span loader was an interesting project. And here's the military version, slightly different configuration with uh, twin tail booms and uh, a unique loading system uh, from the ground. I'm not quite sure how that would have worked. But again, these are proposals and concepts kind of what if, and uh, obviously they never made it off the drawing board. Here's the ATB, which stands for Advanced Tactical Bomber. Uh, best I can say now is that this uh, type of airplane is flying today as the B-21 Raider from Northrop Grumman, uh, a medium size, smaller than the B-2 stealth bomber, uh, and a, a very advanced airplane, but this was an early 1980s uh, version uh, proposed by Douglas. And here's the uh, sea-launched cruise missile uh, in a wing-in-ground-effect vehicle for the Strategic Air Command. This is one of my renderings. And yeah, I know what you're thinking. This looks just like the Caspian Sea Monster, uh, the Russian wing-in-ground-effect vehicle that you see at upper left. And again, this never got past the uh, proposal rendering stage that you see here. The VTX was a, an entire training package for the Navy, uh, and this became the T-45 Goshawk. But the idea was that uh, the Navy would get the actual airplane and all the simulators and all the just training aids and, and the, just a complete package for creating uh, future naval aviators. Uh, the company proposed a version for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, this is my painting of the jet over Randolph Air Force Base, head of the uh Tactical Training Air Command. The primary uh, outsized airlifter in the 1950s was the C-124 Glowmaster II, and Douglas developed a turboprop-powered version, the YC-124B, which was powered by four 5,500-shaft horsepower Pratt & Whitney T-34 turboprop engines. The idea here was that the airplane would be proposed to the Air Force as a tanker, However, they went with the Boeing KC-97. But the turboprop technology translated to an even larger airplane, the XC-132. This airplane never made it off the drawing board, but again, that technology was used in the C-133 Cargo Master, which was developed mainly to carry the new generation of intercontinental ballistic missiles. As late as 1982, advanced turboprop airlifter, airlifters were still under study by Douglas. This is a rendering by uh, my cohort in presentations, uh, Mr. Steve Wright, and uh, a six-engine uh, advanced turboprop machine. Interesting to look at. And then we have all the acronyms, and we're going to decipher all this for you a little later in the program. But here you see a, an air refueling airplane with a cargo airplane. And these, of course, became the C-15 and the KC-10. Interesting to see uh, the actual airplanes. Of course, the C-15 was a uh, prototype, and that evolved into the C-17 Glowmaster III that you see in this photo on the right. And, of course, that's a KC-10 uh, refueling that airplane. 
What about experimental research and flight test aircraft? Well, Douglas had the D558-1 and the D558-2, first airplane to fly twice the speed of sound. So it stood to reason that uh, there would be a D558-3. However, this airplane never uh, got into uh, production. It was the uh, study for what became the X-15. Commercial airliners. This is kind of neat. Well, no, that's not a commercial airliner. That's the uh, Douglas XB-42, known as the Mixmaster for its contra-rotating pusher props. But believe it or not, there was an airliner version of this airplane. And you're not going to believe what they were going to call it. It was the DC-8 Skybus. Uh, I believe uh, the Skybus was a different airplane. We're going to show you that in a moment. And of course, the DC-8 uh, became a four-engine jet transport. Uh, this airplane, which uh, first flew in 1958. But uh, that Skybus idea uh, really emerged as this. This is one of a family of airplanes that I guess you could call a Skybus, but more accurately, it's the Airbus. SST stands for Supersonic Transport. Let's see what Douglas had in mind. In 1962, the Model 2229 was proposed uh, as uh, Douglas's entrant into the uh, supersonic transport sweepstakes with Lockheed and Boeing, uh, Douglas decided not to pursue this design in 1963. But uh, take that three view and make it into a rendering, and you've got this stunning image by the great Ren Wicks. There were other uh, SST studies, a uh, variable geometry aircraft in a painting by R.G. Smith. And this was the winner of the three uh, companies that proposed ideas, the Boeing 2707, seen here in mock-up form. Do, do we have a better picture of this airplane? I think we do. Can we put that up? There we go. Yeah, that's more like it. Uh, in the 1980s, Douglas was still considering possible supersonic transports. This is the DCAST, Advanced Supersonic Transport. And even into the 90s, uh, they were studying designs, but again, these never made it past the study stage. Of course, the first actual SST was the Russian Tu-144, which flew in 1968, followed by the Anglo-French Concorde in 1969. Military DC-10 proposals. This is interesting. We're going to show you a number of uh, airplanes that have never been seen before uh, in this uh, venue. Douglas was always looking to advance the DC-10. Not quite sure how this airplane would have ever parked at a ramp or negotiated the taxiways at uh, uh, traditional airports, but uh, they were always looking for bigger and better ways to uh, use the airplane. And uh, this was one of the military versions, a presidential transport. Of course, that went to the Boeing 747 to replace the 707s of the uh, Kennedy era. And this was called the VC-10, not to be confused with this VC-10. But before we get into the military DC-10 uh, concepts, let's talk about how that airplane all started. It began with the CX program, which was the uh, competition for what became the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy. However, the construction methodology and the uh, power plant technology lent itself to the possibility of a giant wide body airliner. And are you ready? This was going to be the first DC-10, a double-deck four-engine monster in a beautiful painting by R.G. Smith. But the DC-10 actually took form as a twin-engine airplane to meet a requirement by American Airlines to have a 250-seat wide-body machine fly uh, operationally out of New York's LaGuardia Airport. And as you see in this photo, the largest jet at that time operating out of LaGuardia was the Boeing 727. Uh, the American Airlines airplane taking off in a TWA at the gate. Uh, to give the airplane transcontinental range, a third engine was added, as you see here. And the DC-10 operated successfully out of LaGuardia through the 1970s and well into the 1980s. This is an ironic photo because taking off on the runway, of course, is an Airbus A300. So let's get into it. Military DC-10s. Let's start with the intelligence missions. And I should mention that uh, 
most of the aircraft used for these operations were converted or adapted from other existing airplanes. Uh, the two on the left were airliners, a DC-3 and the Lockheed Constellation. And the two on the right, the uh, Boeing B-47 Stratojet, Lockheed uh, C-130 Hercules, adapted for the recon and intel uh, mode. So let's start with this, the DC-10. E-10 Advanced Airborne Command Post, which of course became the Boeing E-4 747. And look at this airplane, all sorts of uh, interesting sensor packages and side-looking radar. Uh, the EC-10A Electronic Intercept version. I love this photo. This is, a, I'll call this the photo of the week. It's the EC-10B multi-sensor surveillance platform being intercepted by a friendly MiG-25 Foxbat. The CP-10, long-range patrol aircraft for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And, uh, of course, they went with the Lockheed P-3 Orion. But uh, an interesting-looking machine. I love the markings. And this, of course, is a beautiful painting by R.G. Smith. Airborne missile launcher, really? Well, yeah. Uh, a number of studies for different types of uh, rotary uh, missile storage and launching out of a DC-10. The carousel launcher, uh, the bomb bay launch with a rotary uh, device. And uh, the final selection was a side <laughs> launching uh, airplane out of uh, uh, launch blisters located on the rear fuselage. And uh, let's take a look at a rendering here. This is by Hank Lozano, the DC-10 standoff bomber. Uh, total payload would have been 64 air launch cruise missiles. Uh, believe it or not, there was resistance from the airlines about having an airliner as a strategic uh, weapon system. There was a concern about confusion, uh, and so that never came to pass. But they even studied uh, intercontinental ballistic missile launches out of a DC-10. And uh, here's a cutaway showing two missiles that could be ejected out of a lower um, <clears throat> bomb bay type device in the uh, lower aft fuselage. And this is a beautiful Pacific Miniatures model, 1 1 64th scale study of that particular airplane. Then there was this, the C-15 program, which was a prototype. Uh, we'll show you in a moment. Uh, this was developed as a medium uh, range uh, STOL type aircraft. And that acronym was AMST, which stood for Advanced Medium Range uh, Short Takeoff and Landing Transport. This airplane flew in uh, 1975, and it won a flyoff competition against Boeing's YC-14. But this airplane was also studied to be adapted for air-launched uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. This is my rendering of such a, a launch here. We see the missile actually on a cradle that was then uh, pulled out of the airplane by a large parachute. And this actually happened. This is a dummy uh, missile launch study out of a C-17 Globemaster III. But up to now, we've seen uh, mostly concepts that just, as I said, never left the drawing board was the term they always used. Let's talk about an airplane that did. And it's this, the ATCA, which stood for Advanced tanker cargo aircraft. The logic here is that for a major Air Force deployment, the tankers would refuel other aircraft, fighters, bombers, whatever, and then cargo airplanes would take all the logistics loads, the uh, men and machines and equipment, spare parts and such. The idea here was that you'd have all that capability in one airplane, the advanced tanker cargo aircraft. This was a converted uh, DC-10 Series 30 convertible freighter adapted for the military mission. And what they would do is uh, this airplane could carry squadron and maintenance personnel, uh, as well as cargo and spare parts, including complete jet engines on their cradles, and have uh, full aerial refueling capability for both Air Force and Navy and foreign airplanes when required. As mentioned, the uh, convertible freighter uh, was equipped with a 10-foot by 22-foot forward cargo door that you see in this cutaway illustration by Chuck Santmeyer. And the total fuel capacity was 356,000 pounds, which theoretically gave the airplane the range to fly nonstop from New York 
to Sydney, Australia. It was called the KC-10 Extender. And in the renderings, uh, we always showed it with company products. Here we get KC-10 refueling an F-15. And uh, even another KC-10. This is by uh, the great George Akimoto. Boeing also proposed the 747 as a tanker. We see it here with the KC-135 boom and a dry hookup flight test with the SR-71. Uh, but uh, the Air Force uh, went with the DC-10 for its accessibility into smaller uh, air bases. And so it was a very significant win for the company. And uh, this cutaway shows you some of the different configurations in the mix of passenger and cargo. Uh, when the markings were finalized, I made one of the first renderings of the airplane, again, refueling an F-15. Um, and I remember this very fondly. I got a pass to go out to the uh, paint shop uh, with my Polaroid and, and actually take the first photos of the painted airplane. It hadn't flown yet, but it was just literally uh, painted the day or two before. And I had the actual markings and made this rendering. First flight was July 12th, 1980. I'd like to show you a comparison uh, with the KC-10 uh, versus the KC-135. KC-10 had a number of uh, very interesting features, uh, among them the hose and drogue housing. Uh, a retractable hose and drogue was uh, available for, as I mentioned, U.S. Navy and foreign aircraft. And then the main boom was a digital fly-by-wire refueling boom with twice the offload capacity of the KC-135. Here we see, uh, this is an interesting size comparison, with the KC-10 and the C-5. And this uh, photo was taken during a four and a half hour test flight at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, operating at speeds up to 400 knots and altitudes as high as 25,000 feet. During this sequence, 48 total refueling contacts were made at different air speeds, different attitudes. Uh, again, just opening the envelope for refueling such a large airplane. KC-10s enjoyed 40 years of continuous service. They are just now starting to be retired. 60 total were built. One was lost in a ground fire in the first year of operation, but 59 KC-10s have soldiered on for the Air Force. And uh, I want to show you the different color schemes. This is what we call the white top, got an airliner type color scheme there with the stripe. And then this was affectionately referred to as Shamu because the airplane looked like a giant killer whale. Current color scheme is the standard Air Force gray seen here on a KC-46 Pegasus, which is the tanker that is going to replace the KC-10. And I've always been fascinated by future concepts and aviation art. And uh, I want to show you a very striking example of what happens when secret projects become reality. So there you have it, a look at uh, Douglas Secret Projects, Concepts and Proposals. As always, special thanks to the great artists I was so privileged to have worked with in my time at the Douglas Aircraft Company and all the wonderful people who supported the presentations group with uh, photos and technical material. And again, to Craig Caston, engineer co-author of American Secret Projects, available on Amazon and at all booksellers. Uh, Craig has been a, a great friend over the years, a great supporter and uh, generated the concept for this program. So thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We uh, enjoy so very much bringing them to you. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love having you on board. And please do hit the like button on the way out. It does help us in a big way with YouTube. So until next time, take care.